we doing? Great. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> um, my talk is not about pole dancing. So sorry about that. Sorry for my it's my shirt. That's, <laughs> that's how you tie it all together. I'm just trying to be a part of it. I was like, everyone else talking about pole stuff. I want to just people know that I do pole stuff. Um, but hi. Hi. Um, my name is Nora. Bach, B O C K, Sally, for future reference. <laughs> <laughs> my last name, I know it's really hard to pronounce, but yeah, that's it. Um, so, what I'm here to talk about is talking about my own experience and getting a court order of protection against an abuser. Um, but before I get into that, I just want to say thank you, Sally, and Full Strong Body Works for having me and for hosting this. I think it's so important to have space to talk about issues like this. So, thank you. I'm 28 years old. Uh, I'm a Cancer. I live and work in Chicago. Um, and like I said before, I am a survivor of an abusive romantic relationship. And it's it was, you know, I don't want to say you're run-of-the-mill abusive relationship, because that's a bad term to use. But it was exactly that. It was very heavily emotional abuse, controlling, manipulation, um, very, very high jealousy, bad temper. Um, we lived together, so my home environment was very, very hostile and very, very violent. A little sidebar. One of the things he never liked was women wearing crop tops or yoga pants, so... Oh, yeah! yeah. yeah. That's why I wore crop top and yoga pants, because fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so, basically, I was... Yeah, this is more for the crop top. <laughs> but, basically, I was so ingratiated in the relationship that in order for me to get out of it, my family had to get very heavily involved. Um, my brother, my brother and my sister are going to be key components of this story, and they're going to be kind of my anchor throughout it all, so I'm going to reference them a lot. My sister's actually here. Hi! So, yeah, so basically, my family got involved. My brother actually flew from New York to come and get me out of this relationship, and him and my dad came to my office, picked me up, and said, you're not living this way anymore. Um, so that was one of the hardest days of my life. It was really hard to leave something, which is perfectly normal if you're in an abusive relationship. It is hard to leave. It is hard to walk away. No one should ever feel ashamed for that, and I want to make that very direct from the get-go. Um, but of course, I had all those feelings and feelings of guilt, and pretty much immediately after the relationship ended, I began getting incessant phone calls, emails, texts. I would block a number, a new number would call me, I'd block an email, a new email would be created, he started calling me on Gmail, Gchat. He started emailing my work email, personal email, any type of communication he tried to find he would do. Um, and that continued for six months. And essentially the straw that broke the camel's back was he started accusing me of stealing from him, and it, the, the messages themselves ranged very much from, oh, I love you, I miss you so much, I'm the best person for you, to you're never gonna find love again, I'm the best person for you, blah, blah, blah. bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. <laughs> so it was that day, it was in September, towards the end of September, and my family and I made the decision to go get a court order of protection. And essentially what we were trying to achieve was a two-year no-contact order. It's also known as a restraining order. It's basically, this person cannot reach you under any circumstances. So I got my brother and my sister, and I went to work that day, or I didn't go to work that day. We just went straight to the DV, or the Domestic Violence Courthouse, and we began the process of doing it. And so anyway, saddle up, kids, because it's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It's great. It's a fun story about dealing with a domestic abuse. <laughs> <laughs> so, another thing to know about court, the thing to know before you go into it, is you want to save everything. I started saving all my emails just in the hypothetical. Um, you know, is this something that could be a problem? This is threatening. Is this something he's going to try to take me to court over? I'm going to save this. I'm going to log it. I put it all in a folder. And I also want to, before I want to get too far in my story, I want to disclaimer too that. I'm very much a person of privilege talking in my story. My sister is a lawyer, my father is a retired police officer, and I'm a young white girl, and I'm going through the Chicago court system. And my goal in this too is I want to help those who don't have the same privileges that I have. And I think that sharing my story and knowing what to expect could really help negate some of the issues you might know, or might run into. Um, so day one, we go to the DV court. We got my brother and my sister in tow, and we're like, gonna get an order of protection. Like, we just walked in, <laughs> and I was ready. I was 
in the mode of everything is terrible, this is terrible, but we're going to do it, it's going to be necessary, let's go. Um, day one, we are doing what is called a petition for an emergency order of protection. And you're not getting the full OP. What you're essentially doing is you're going in and you're advocating to a judge being like, this is why I feel like I am in danger and I need an emergency that will encompass me for the next 21 days. Um, and then after those 21 days, you go back to court, you say, yes, I want to extend it, and it goes from there. Um, one of the things I didn't realize before I went to a courthouse is you can't really bring anything in a courthouse, especially in the DB courthouse, because it's just packed. It's always just really, really busy, and you never know what's going in there. Emotions are really high. So we smuggled everything on my sister like a pack mule because she's a lawyer. And she, <laughs> she could bypass everything. And going through metal detectors was like, yeah, it's not a big deal until, if you're like me, you were going to go to pull that night. So you got your bag, and then you put it through, and you're walking through, and you're like, oh, shit. And then you look on the little metal detector thing, and there's just your pole heels <laughs> in their screws, and it just looks like a deadly weapon. And the court officer was like, what is that? And my dumbass wanted to make a joke and be like, well, it's not a bomb. Wow. <laughs> and thankfully, my brother was like, it's a shoe. And we just stood there like, shit. And then the woman, just her eyes slowly screwed green. She's like, you can't bring that in here. As long as story short, my brother had to take all of our belongings that we couldn't smuggle in our sister like a pack mule and run it down to the nearest hotel and be like, hi, I'm so sorry, but we're at the courthouse and we really need to order your stuff here, but we can't bring it inside. Like, Can you just please hold our stuff? Aww. And they did. Thank Aww. you. <laughs> so I didn't bring my murder shoes into the courthouse. Aww. Murder shoes. So you want to save everything. Don't bring your murder shoes into a courthouse. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. Um, you can't bring your phone, you can't be on your phone in the courthouse. Um, unless your sister's a lawyer and you sneak it in. You, they don't want anyone documenting anyone or taking pictures of people without their consent. You have people dealing with family issues and abusive relationships, abusive partners, tensions are high. If you take your phone out in that waiting room, someone's gonna come find you. And that doesn't sound very much like, you're like, oh, I don't need my phone, but if you're just sitting in a waiting room, like waiting for an officer to call your name, all you wanna do is just scroll on Instagram and think about anything else. <laughs> But you can't take the phone out. That was something that was really shocking to me because you do feel really kind of cut off and you're just kind of reading like years old magazines that have been sitting around for who knows how long. Um, and another thing too is the people who work in the criminal justice system are very much desensitized to people in your situation. That is not to say that they do not care. They just have heard it all. They've been through it. You cannot go to court officials and expect them to give you any type of empathy. You need to have people with you who are strong and will offer you that support because unfortunately it's just not something you're gonna find from a judge, from a bailiff, from anyone else working in the court system. They're just, to them that's just their every day. To you it's the worst thing imaginable, but you just have to brace yourself for the fact they're not here to be my friend, they're here to be fair and pass a law or pass some type of judgment that they deem is most fair to everyone in the room. So all of that was kind of jarring and that was kind of shocking to learn, so. So we go in, do 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 do, can't just walk in and be like, hello, yes, I'd like one order of protection, please. Thank you, Gary. Oh, it's not going to happen. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to advocate, and you're going to have to go and write an affidavit, which is basically a written statement that will be used as evidence in court. Um, mine was five pages long, front to back. They gave us more pages. Um, I was constantly just like, this is terrible, and I'm freaking out. So my sister actually wrote it for me while I kind of conveyed everything to her. and. We went through the whole story of my relationship, why I felt threatened, why I'm currently feeling threatened. Here's, you know, 60 plus emails of him contacting me incessantly, him acknowledging that he doesn't, I don't want to talk to him, etc., etc. And then on top of that, you have to kind of give a statement of this is what he looks like, this is how tall he is, this is where his current address is, which is very important because you need to have the address of who the respondent is, who you're serving the OP to, so they actually will receive it. Um, so that was something I didn't know, so I kind of had to like scrounge up his address through the means and just kind of be coy about it, because we were living together before we broke up. Once we broke up, he obviously lived somewhere else, so in order for the sheriffs to serve him with it, we had to make sure we had that information and supply it to the court officials. The next step of that process is they put it in a file, they give you a case file, and then they send you upstairs to the actual courtroom. Um, you sit in a, it's, it's not like a, a court you see on TV, it's open court, there's tons of people in there, doing the same thing you are. It's mostly for getting an order of protection. Oh, and also, this took all day. I was like, I'm gonna go in and not go back to work and go to pool that day, but it took like like six, 
seven hours. We were in court just waiting and waiting for someone to call you. Well, like I said, the DV court is just always packed, and you kind of always have to anticipate it, that it will be, especially on a Monday morning. Also, key information too, time is of the essence. If you sit on anything for a week, it's then going to be used, why didn't you come in sooner? You must not feel threatened because you came in a week after the last reported incident. So in my case, the last reported incident where I felt threatened happened on a Saturday. We went in that Monday. It has to be that quick. Otherwise, it very well could get thrown out. It's serious. They are not fucking around. And it's horrifying to be in that situation. <laughs> and because they're just all business about it. So we go upstairs to the courtroom upstairs. I think you pick a cup of wine. <laughs> uh, we go upstairs to the upstairs courtroom. They call my case file. We were waiting on other people. It took like an hour or two to get through everyone. And there were people there that were literally like, I heard them say, why did you wait a week to come in? Where's your evidence of this? No, it's not going to get approved. And I was like, oh shit. Like, I just, I thought if it was something that you wanted, it would be given to you. I literally thought it was that cut and dry. It was not. Um, so the judge calls me, I go up by myself, like it's on a bench, like you go on like a podium and there's like the judge in front of you and then all the court officials like buzzing around and doing stuff and it's literally a scenario where you want to speak when spoken to. You just answer the questions as they ask them based off your affidavit. They have all the evidence in front of them that you gave earlier and they have everything that you provided. They're reading through it, they're reviewing it and then they're asking you questions based off that. In my case, it was like, how do you know that this person is emailing you is your ex-boyfriend? And I knew his email because it was his gamer tag. His email was newpammer420 at gmail.com. I didn't tell the judge that. My ex-boyfriend's email was newpammer420. And I was like, I dated someone with that as their email. <laughs> and then they're just like, they have no idea what it means, I'm assuming, because she didn't fucking react. <laughs> On to the next order of business. And I was like, Cool. Um, continuing on in a similar situation, um, I had a series of text messages that were cryptic, but I knew were from him. And it was like, how do you know it's your boyfriend or your ex-boyfriend who sent these text messages? And I was like, he's the one in the black Spider-Man suit? <laughs> like, nothing will make you really regret the person you dated. You have a judge and saying like, oh yeah, I dated that guy in the Spider-Man suit. <laughs> I, I had my sister's advice to be like, just be nice, be quick, just say yes, no, yes, no, expand upon something if they want, and they granted it. So, you know, me and my brother and my sister, who we also called ourselves Legal Team Bach, we, <laughs> we celebrated, we put our hands in, and then we got, you know, had to be like, yeah, we did the thing. Um, so then that means I got granted my emergency order of protection. So for 21 days, there was a no contact order, he was going to be served with it, and then 21 days I had to go back to court. So 21 days pass and no contact. I was like, yeah, so far so good. So theoretically, we go into court. I go in front of a judge. I say, hi, yes, I'd like to extend this for the plenary OP. And plenary just means absolute. It just means it's going to be extended in place for two years. It's more of a serious thing. And if you hear nothing from him, you're good to go. It's just going to go automatically into effect. You get the same paperwork. So you go there. You know, I go in front of the judge. She's like, do you want to extend it? I'm like, yes, I would like to. And she grants it. She's like, I am going to issue this plenary order of protection, yada yada yada, we sit down, legal team back and I, we celebrate, we're like, yeah, we did it. Um, but then my ex-boyfriend walked into the courtroom, <laughs> and I let out just like a fish out of water, like, <gasps> like just echoed throughout this little courtroom of just me gasping for air, and then my siblings immediately just like grabbed my hand, it was like very like, I was like, just don't, don't freak out in the courtroom, all right? That's not going to be good for anyone involved, but yeah, he walked in and he just strutted right up to the bench and was like, hi, I'm here. And you know, that's not, that's not how it works. It's not a trial case. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> he should have been there 45 minutes ago when I was there, but he showed up like an hour late. Um, mm. So we were like, cool, like, let's go. It's already signed and stamped. Like, let's get the thing and go home. So we're celebrating. We were happy. We did it. I get home that night and I get served the paperwork to come back to court in 21 days because he's contested it. 
it is anyone's legal right to say, hey, I think this order of protection is unlawful, and I'm going to fight it. So instead of getting my plenary OP, the next step I had to do was a hearing. So because my family and I were in a particular state of fuck this guy, hmm. my sister recommended a lawyer that, and I quote, is going to make him look really fucking stupid in front of a judge. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, great, we'll do a back guy. We were like the sleaziest, like, city slicker looking slick back hair motherfucking lawyer. And he walked in, his name was like Rick or some shit. And I was like, again because like I think I called him on the phone and he was just like eating a sandwich <laughs> and I was just like yes it was very emotional and hard abuse and I just hear him chewing and I'm like all right like can we just, like, <laughs> let's just set up the date to like talk about the damn thing at the time I was very upset I was like why does anyone care about my problems I was just emotional the whole time a lot of people cared about my problems I had a really great support I was just being sat in my feelings about Rick the lawyer eating a sandwich while I was trying to tell him about my abusive ex-boyfriend. So, so we get little mom hotties and we're, in my sister's apartment, we're prepping for court the next day. It's asking me all those questions again. Did he ever hit you? Were the police ever involved? Did you ever go to the hospital? And I was like, no, no, no. Um, so it made me feel like, God, is my relationship like valid? Like, is it my... Should I do this? Which I had to get those thoughts out of my head because yes, absolutely, abuse is abuse. If someone is making you feel unsafe, you have every right to say, fuck that person and get a court order against them. Yes. So there's yeah. that. Don't let Rick the lawyer make you feel otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> no, Rick was great. Rick made him look like a fucking idiot, so he did his job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the hearing go over, and he's asking me questions that are very uncomfortable to talk to anyone about, let alone a strange man. But it was good couple hours, the next day we go to the hearing. So my ex is already there. I was like, oh, you showed up on time for fucking one. Like, you know, I do just go back and like, that's my ex-boyfriend bullshit. I'm like, how nice you wear your nice fucking shirt. Like, <laughs> you dressed up in your pretty little black dress. Like, you just go, like, you just go to a place in your brain that's just naturally petty. <laughs> Nothing will change that, even if you're just like kind of terrified of the person. <laughs> so basically there was an exchange of evidence that happened. We gave him all the emails, and he gave us a passport photo of a girl and a signed statement that they were on a date. And my brother was like, he just wants you to know who's fucking. He's like, That's what this is. Like, he's just trying to be like, hey, I'm dating someone else, like in court. Like, this is his one way to like contact you. And he's just gonna be like, look at this hot French girl I'm banging. And God damn it, she was hot. Like, <laughs> Everyone's trying to be petty, but he can't have Instagram, so he just slides you a passport. Over. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, Spider-Man? <laughs> so, so we give him the evidence. He kind of just throws it back, and you know, which was unsurprising to me, but we had like a little huddle, like in a little huddle room before that, and my lawyer, Rick the lawyer, just goes, hey, it's kind of goofy. And I was like, yeah, that's, what, that's why we're here. He's a little goofy. <laughs> um, so we go up to the bench. At this point, like the case has been, you get the case called. You go up to say like hi, we're here for a hearing, and then you wait for all the other people to clear out of the courtroom. Then we go up in front, and it's like him, my lawyer, and me. And on this day, my brother and my sister are with me, and my mom was here. And um, right off the bat, they kind of tell us like, no one make any disapproving noises, and just keep it quiet. Like we know emotions run high. My mother did not do that. She did a constant like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and my sister was like, "You have to stop. You're gonna get thrown out of the room. And my mom's also an artist, so each time I went up and like came back and sat next to her, there was just more doodles of people in the courtroom that she was drawing. <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, are you mom? Are you okay?" She's like, "Yeah." <sighs> No, my mom's great. It was really great that she came to support, but... Oh, and if anyone was wondering, my sister could not represent me because she's a lawyer and we're related by blood, and also she probably would have tackled my ex in open court, which probably would have ruined your career. So it's probably good that you didn't represent me. I'm like grabbing range of my ex-boyfriend. So, 
So the hearing starts, um, and this to me was like mind blowing because I had never seen anyone talk to my ex this way. Um, he was always someone that just, when it got to a point, just would tear me down and tear me down and tear me down. And I just would get to a point where I would just say, you're right, you're right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, that doesn't go well in front of a judge, apparently. <laughs> because initially what happened was he was like, oh, I didn't get any of this evidence. This is the first time I'm seeing it. And my lawyer just goes, objection, we gave him to him 40 minutes ago. He had plenty of time to read it. And then the judge goes, do you want more time to read it? And he's like, well, I, she's like, good, you get more time to read it. And she just fucking walked around. <laughs> <laughs> because everything was already terrible. And I just like, if I had to have a conversation with him, like that just won't go well for anyone. And so my lawyer crosses him, he crosses me, he's asking me questions about like, didn't you like kiss me once? And I was like, <laughs> you know, like he was just like grasping at straws trying to do anything. And here's a point in our story where he did what every man who gets caught in trouble does. He cried. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was like, and no, no bullshit. My sister had told me she's like, kind of like half joking, half serious. She was like, if you cry in front of a judge, like that'll look really good for you. But I was just sitting there and I was like, I'm so fucking mad right now. <laughs> like I was like, just crying, or I just cried. But I was like, I had spent so much time crying at the expense of this fucking human person that I was just like, no, nope, I can't cry anymore because fuck you. You're Aww. the one who's crying for fucking once because you finally got caught and someone's getting you in fucking trouble. So, you know, he cried about how he's really not that bad of a person. <sighs> and he started talking about he had an aunt that died. Like, he was doing that thing where he was trying to get any excuse. I'm not that bad of a person. I just had bad things happen to me. And the judge was like, that, they would cut him off and be like, objection, that has nothing to do with anything. You're here based on these emails and the fact that you were stalking this person. And he was like, I wasn't stalking her. But in the eyes of the law, stalking is any prolonged type of communication that you do not want with another party. And there were clear communications in the email where he said, I know you don't want to talk to me. However, I'm going to continue talking to you. So they granted my plenary order of protection I got for two years after that. And that felt really good. Because, thank you, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> we did it! And that was just a really good feeling, but there was a lot of, I was like, I don't know if I feel happy. Because at the end of the day, I was like, this is just another step in the process of what comes next for me. Because when someone who's an abuser continues to talk to you, you become unable to move past that person. You are stuck on them. Every time you hear from them, every time they look in your direction, it reopens up old wounds. So there's no moving on from it. And everyone has a right to move on from pain. Everyone has a right to move on from a person who just kept a fucking vice around their neck for so long. And getting the order of protection was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, but it has never crossed my mind that it wasn't worth it. It was finally just this on paper documented, this person can never bother you again. And it was worth it. So where am I today? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> PTSD from an abusive relationship is invaluable. It has helped me immeasurably. I'm in a relationship with an amazing human being. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I made him come tonight because if I, I was like, if I just do this and I say everything's fine, I'm still single. Like no one's gonna. Find me. <laughs> so thank you for being my proof that I get better, Mark. I'm just kidding. You don't need a man. <laughs> Fuck. 
fucking time throughout that whole speech I just gave, so <laughs> kudos to you, but yeah, no, things are good, and I'm going to throw a little pole dancing tidbit in because it is, you know, pole talks. Um, when I started pole dancing, it was at the very tail end of my abusive relationship, and it was something I had to fight for. He obviously, he was very misogynistic, he hated it, and I fought him tooth and nail to be able to go to my first pole dancing class. I had to hide my pole clothes, I had to not show my videos, I would walk really slow on my way home because I didn't want him to see all my videos that I was watching and repeat over and over and over again. So to me, pole dancing has always just been synonymous for my freedom. And ultimately at the end of the day, that's what I felt. Thank you. Yay.